So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the OMSI Family Science Night 2021. My name is Tamara Pugh. I'm the program manager for Oregon Mesa. I'd also like to introduce Bianca, who is our program coordinator. Bienvenida. Gracias a Tamara Depew, nuestra directora de programas de Oregon Mesa. Mi nombre es Bianca Chaquem, coordinadora de programas de Oregon Mesa. For accessibility, we are offering Spanish translation for this introduction piece. However, we apologize that we will not be able to offer Spanish translation for the show portion of the event because of the live elements. We will upload the video to our YouTube channel after the event, and you can view with subtitles in your preferred language there. Ofrecemos traducción al español para nuestra introducción. Sin embargo, nos disculpamos porque no podremos ofrecer traducción al español para la presentación de ONSI debido a los elementos en vivo. Subiremos el video a nuestro canal en YouTube después del evento y podrá verlo con subtítulos en su idioma preferido ahí. Here are some guidelines for the event. As I had said earlier, the session is being recorded. We've turned off the audience video and audio features. If you have questions, please use the Q&A tab on the right-hand side of your screen, and please upvote your favorite questions and we'll make sure those get asked. We will remove people who post inappropriate content in the Q&A. Aquí hay algunas pautas para el evento. Esta sesión se está grabando. Las funciones de audio y video de la audiencia están desactivadas. Envíenos sus preguntas a través de la pestaña Q y A a la derecha de su pantalla. Vota tus preguntas favoritas. Eliminaremos a las personas que publiquen contenido inapropiado en las preguntas y respuestas. After this session, you can share photos or stories with us on Instagram, we're at Oregon Mesa, or on Facebook.com slash Oregon Mesa. You can use hashtag Oregon Mesa, hashtag OMSI FSN2021, hashtag Mesa, hashtag 2021, hashtag students in STEM, hashtag making change with Mesa, and hashtag PDX. Also, please complete a feedback form at the end to help us make even better opportunities like this in the future. Después de esta sesión, comparte fotos con nosotros en Instagram y Facebook. Complete un formulario de comentarios en al final del evento para ayudarnos a crear oportunidades aún mejores como esta en el futuro. I know that we are online and joined by folks throughout the region, but I want to start today's event by honoring the land that our host institution, Portland State University, sits on. Portland State University is located in the heart of downtown Portland, Oregon, in Multnomah County. We honor the indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral homelands we stand on, the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala, Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge the ancestors of this place and to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. Portland State University está ubicada en el corazón del centro de Portland, Oregon, en el condado de Montmuja. Honramos a los pueblos indígenas en cuyas tierras ancestrales y tradicionales nos paramos. Las bandas Motnoma, Taclamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watala de Chinook, Tualatin, Calapaya y muchas otras naciones indígenas del río Colombia. 
Es importante reconocer a los antepasados de este lugar y reconocer que estamos aquí por los sacrificios que se les impusieron. Al recordar estas comunidades, honramos su legado, sus vidas y sus descendientes. This evening, we are excited to bring you this explosive show from Amzi. To kick things off, I'd like to introduce you to Alex. Estamos emocionados de traerles este espectáculo explosivo de OMSI. Me, gusta, me gustaría presentarles a Alex, el coordinador del laboratorio de química de OMSI. And off to the show. Hey. Hello, scientists. I apologize for my sort of spooky looking appearance right now. The lights just got turned off on us. So we're working on getting them turned back on and finding a backup plan. Uh, but in the meantime, let me introduce myself. Uh, like uh, Tamara and Bianca just said, my name is Alex. I am the chemistry lab educator here at OMSI, which means that it is my job to be responsible for all of the amazing chemistry that happens in this wonderful lab behind me that is darkened at this particular moment. But I've been working in museums, in science museums, teaching science for about eight years now, and I absolutely love it. I'm so excited that all of you are here and that we'll have a chance to share some of our chemistry with you. It should be a lot of fun. We're going to be talking about chemical reactions and how to recognize them. Before we do anything else, though, um, while we're sort of working on getting lights back on a little bit, I apologize, this is really strange. Let's talk a little bit about how we're going to talk to each other. Because one of the biggest parts of OMSI is that our experiments and our activities and our exhibits are for the people who are using them. In a perfect world, you would be able to be here at OMSI trying these experiments for yourselves. However, everything is a little bit weird right now. So for the time being, we're going to share our chemistry with you through this virtual method, which means that things are going to be a little bit different. I do still want to make sure that I'm hearing your thoughts and your ideas and your questions. So there are going to be a couple ways that we can do that. I might be repeating some things that were mentioned earlier, but feel free to utilize the chat. There will be times when I'm asking what you think about things or ask you to make guesses about something that might happen. And the Big Marker chat is going to be the place to do that. I will also have times when I might be asking a question and presenting a poll to ask your ideas on specific things. So feel free to pay attention and participate in those as much as you like. And then at the very end, we should have some time for questions. Questions are my very favorite thing, but I'm actually really glad that Bianca and Tamara had this organized such that questions happen at the end because if I'm being honest, I tend to get distracted by questions because they're one of my favorite things. So as we're doing our chemistry here today, uh, if you have anything that pops into your head, feel free to write it down, drop it in the Q&A section, and I would love to answer some of your questions at the end. That would be awesome. Okay, now, I'm also working from an iPad so I can see those questions and chats. So if I look down, that's what I'm doing. But we're almost ready for chemistry. Oh, a little bit of light. Scott to the rescue. I introduced myself, but I am joined here in the OMSI Turbine Hall by our wonderful volunteer, Scott, who is helping to run our camera and is the rescuer with the lights. <laughs> That's much better, Scott. Thank you. <laughs> it's not perfect. Hopefully the overhead lights come back and help at some point, but we will soldier on because the, the show must go on. Now, before we can do any of our science, we have to talk about being a good scientist because there are a couple things that scientists do. The first thing that scientists do is that we make sure that we're being safe. So we have, Scott and I both have masks on because we're sharing the turbine hall right now. We want to make sure we're keeping each other safe. I also have a lab coat to protect my body as well as to be very stylish. You'll also notice that starting right now, I'm going to put goggles on to protect my eyeballs. Eyeballs are pretty sensitive organs and they can be 
kind of difficult to fix when they get hurt. So I want to make sure that I'm protecting my eyeballs. So that's one way we're being safe. Now, I also should mention at the very beginning, and I will remind you throughout the show, that the experiments that we're doing today fall into the category of do not try these things at home. There will be some amazing chemical reactions, including some fire. It'll be awesome. But you will notice by my lab coat that I am a trained professional, capital T, capital P, trained professional. And I know how to do these experiments correctly, and I know how to do them safely. So until one day in your future, maybe you are also a trained professional, these are experiments that should remain just for other trained professionals. Sound good? Awesome. Now, I'm ready to start talking about chemistry. I've been talking a lot. So let's think about how we're going to, how we're going to share this chemistry experience with each other, because chemistry is all about observing things, making observations using our senses. Now, things are a little bit different right now. So in this method of sharing chemistry, what are, what are the senses we can use right now? What are the senses that you can use as we're observing chemistry? Think about what you can do right now. What are the senses you can observe with? And we're going to put a poll out because I want to hear your thoughts. What senses can we use? Click any of them that speak to you. What senses can we use in this format right now? Okay, I'm seeing people starting to answer. I'm seeing a lot of sight, a lot of hearing. Fantastic. Now, all of these are senses we can use if we're doing chemistry together in person, for sure. We can use our sense of smell. Scientists smell things by wafting them. It looks kind of goofy. Now, taste. Taste is an interesting sense. There are certain things that you can taste. However, the chemistry we're doing today, we don't want to taste this kind of chemistry. If you want to taste your chemistry, I highly recommend baking. Cookies, brownies, cake all wonderful things. Our primary method of observing tonight is going to be using our eyeballs. We're going to be using our sight. So that brings me to our first experiment, our first thing to observe. Our collection of experiments tonight is called Lights, Camera, Reaction. It's actually very ironic right now. Observe, lights. Camera. Reaction. We are going to be looking for signs of chemical reactions in all of the experiments that we're doing today. And I want us to be able to think about how we can recognize when a chemical reaction is happening. Because as we're doing experiments, eventually something happens in our brain that makes us go, oh, oh, that's chemistry. Those are the kinds of things I want to talk about. So let's practice making some observations. I'm going to start with these containers right here. Let's go ahead and have our fellow scientists, everyone, go ahead and use the chat. Let's make some observations about what I have in these containers right here. How would you describe? What's going on here? What are some things you can observe? Put your answers in the chat. Ah, I see Salvador is saying water. We have green liquid. They all look like liquids, fantastic. Yeah, we can tell that the stuff I have in this container is liquid. Liquids take the shape of the containers that are holding them. So they all look like liquids. I can swirl them. Yeah. Some of our fellow scientists are saying that it looks like water. These two in particular look like water, but this one's green. Now, we have three different liquids, right? Sometimes in chemistry, 
we combine things together. We mix things together to see what happens. So what is something that might happen if I were to combine two of these liquids? What's something that we might notice? Let's say these two. What is something that we might notice if we mix two of these liquids together? Give me your best guess. What's something that you expect? Ooh, okay, I'm seeing some answers. I'm seeing some people think it's gonna bubble and fizz if you've ever made a baking soda and vinegar volcano. Maybe something similar. A lot of folks think it might change color. Fewer people saying explosion than I would have guessed, to be totally honest with you. Some people think it might not do anything. If two of these are water and we pour them together, maybe nothing will happen. Exactly. Ah, we've got some guesses in the chat as well. I'll tell you what, let's find out. I'm gonna mix some of this clear liquid with this green liquid. Let's observe. It did a thing. It looks different now. Go ahead and put in the chat. What do you notice? <laughs> I see Nathaniel is saying something involving things doing something somehow. Yes, that is exactly right. Something is doing something. What does it look like? Salvador says it's orange now. Yeah, we saw a color change. So when we were observing these chemicals combining together, it changed color. So something happened. We created something new that changed the color of this liquid. Now, if this clear liquid changed the color of the middle liquid that started out green, does anybody have any ideas? What is this one going to do? Do we think it's going to do the same thing or something different? Put your answers in the chat. What do we think? Some people think it looks like apple cider. I'm almost certain it would not taste like apple cider. What do we think? What do we think this one's going to do? It turned into orange. Ah, somebody thinks it might explode. Perhaps. I do have fire extinguishers nearby. Ah, it might do something different. It might reverse it. Let's find out. Ooh. What's it look like now? Raphael said it might turn a new color. Yeah. So we can observe that this is a different color than it was either time before. Now here's one of my favorite parts of being a scientist. I get to explain to you what's going on in this experiment. A magician would say, poof, magic. However, I am a scientist. And I can tell you that in this center container, I have put an indicator. Indicators are something that chemists use to tell us what kinds of chemicals are nearby. So I have an indicator and two different kinds of chemicals. We call them acids and bases. This indicator will turn acids pink and bases purple. And if we combine them together, those acids and bases can neutralize each other to land somewhere in the middle. Let's see if I can get back to something resembling that green that we started with. Closer. I'm going to call that good. I'm probably not going to get closer than that. <laughs> I see someone is disappointed that we haven't had any explosions. We haven't had explosions yet. Keep that in mind. Okay, so changing color is one way to recognize a chemical reaction. It's one of the reasons chemists use indicators so much, because those color changes can tell us that something new is being created, some new kind of chemical. Now, some indicators tell us about acids and bases. Now, before we move on to our next experiment, I want to do one, actually, I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to scoot these off to the side. Some indicators 
can tell us different things. I want to introduce this now because we're going to have to use it later. This is another liquid, right? This liquid, I don't even need to add anything to. Watch this. Stayed closed the entire time. Interesting, but that changed color too. So something is reacting in this liquid. I wonder if I can get it to do it again. Pink. Let me keep shaking it. Mm. Okay. Now before I explain, does anyone have guesses? What is making this liquid change color? I haven't added any, any new liquids. What's going on? See, Joseph said friction. Yeah, it turned purple, right? Yeah, pretty impressive, huh? Interesting. <laughs> Somebody says, it's magic. Close. Magic is science that we just don't understand yet. And here's the best part. We can come back to that. I'm going to leave this off to the side and let y'all think about it. Because we have color changes one way to tell that a chemical reaction is happening, but there are so many more. Now, I saw in the chat earlier, someone mentioned an experiment called elephant toothpaste, which gives me a chance to talk about this second experiment. Now, the experiment we're going to do next, one of the ingredients that we use is called hydrogen peroxide. Now, has anybody used hydrogen peroxide before? Do you know what you might use hydrogen peroxide for when you're not doing science? Is anybody familiar with this chemical? Ah, some people put it on scrapes or cuts. Yeah, that's what, that's what my, my family used it for when I was a smaller scientist than I am now. I used to scrape my knees a lot, and you would pour hydrogen peroxide on it. It would bubble and get white, and it would kind of sting. Now, this is normal hydrogen peroxide that you can just get at the grocery store. Now, here's where we're going to get a little more technical. Does anyone know, well, I'll have you put your answers in the chat. Does anyone happen to know the chemical formula for water, just like regular water? Does anyone know the crazy science name, the geeky name for water? Go ahead and put your answer in the chat if you know. I bet somebody knows it. What might a scientist call water? Ah, somebody knows it, H2O. Regular water is a molecule made with two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. You stick them all together, you get H2O, and that's water. Now, hydrogen peroxide looks very similar. The chemical formula for hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. It's like water, but with one extra oxygen. Now, here's what's weird. Hydrogen peroxide breaks down all the time. It breaks apart into two pieces, into water and oxygen, like the stuff we breathe in the air. It's happening right now. Isn't it exciting? Can you see it? You can't. I'm kidding. Those molecules are so teeny tiny that we could never see them with our eyeballs. So instead, what we have to do is we have to do some chemistry to speed up that chemical reaction because those molecules are so tiny and they're breaking apart really slowly. And y'all are going to want to go to bed at some point. We could stand here for a couple days to watch this, but I feel like we have more interesting things to do with our time. So I'm going to tell you about a kind of chemical called a catalyst. A catalyst is something that speeds up a chemical reaction that's already happening. Some of you may have actually interacted with this catalyst before. I'm going to use yeast. Yeast like the stuff you bake in bread. Yeast is a wonderful catalyst. It's actually a living thing. You might know this already. 
but yeast is alive. And what it does is it can take hydrogen peroxide, those H2O2 molecules, and break them apart into water and oxygen much faster than they would do on their own. We're gonna watch it happen. Ready? Here we go. <laughs> Put some observations in the chat. How can you tell? How can you tell? Oh, actually, we, oh, we have a poll for this one. What's, what's happening right now? How can you tell that a chemical reaction is happening? What can we see? Oh, man. <laughs> Lots of bubbles. The general consensus is that it is bubbling. Yes. This chemical reaction created all of these bubbles. When this yeast broke apart those peroxide molecules into those two separate pieces, the water is left over in the container and all of these bubbles are full of the oxygen that we just made. It expanded. We created a gas that was not there before. Ah, oh, that's such a good one. Now, in chemistry, sometimes we want to change our experiments a little bit, maybe to make them bigger or more exciting. Does anyone have any ideas for how we could make this experiment bigger or more exciting? Go ahead and put your ideas in the chat. How could we make this bigger or more exciting? So I feel like this is OMSI. We can, we can do, we can go bigger. Any thoughts, any ideas? How could we make this bigger or more exciting? Hmm. I see Salvador thinking. Oh, somebody says more yeast. More of everything. Yeah, if we use more of the ingredients, that could make the experiment bigger tell you what, I'm going to scoot this off to the side because if we're going to use more of the ingredients, I'm going to need a bigger set, of bigger, bigger set of experiment tools. So instead of a container about this big, I'm going to use this one. Now, you'll notice that I put gloves on because, once again, scientists are safe. And the reason I'm putting these gloves on is because we need more hydrogen peroxide, right? So I can use more liquid, but I also happen to have some hydrogen peroxide that is about 10 times stronger than the peroxide we used in that first experiment. Now... That's stronger peroxide, but we're looking for bigger and more exciting, right? So that was the end of that bottle, but I think we can do better. Let me add a little bit more. Ooh, dropping the lid. Now, if we really want to examine this experiment, we're going to need to see all those bubbles. I'm going to try and trap them. I'm going to try and trap all that oxygen in some soap. Let's swirl that around to make sure it mixes in. OK. Now, one of our fellow scientists mentioned that we should maybe use more yeast to make this experiment happen bigger, better, faster. How about instead, I'm going to use a faster catalyst. Yeast takes some time to sort of eat its way through that peroxide. This catalyst is called potassium iodide, which might not mean a whole lot, but it's a white powder looks kind of like sugar or salt. 
would not taste very good. And in order to make sure that this powder can mix with our peroxide nice and fast, I'm going to dissolve it in some water. Alrighty, my fellow scientists. Go ahead and put in the chat, do you think this is going to be bigger and more exciting? Are we going to be successful? Mm. Ready? Here we go. Woo! <laughs> Oh, that was a good one. <laughs> Go ahead and tell me in the chat, what kinds of things are you seeing? Is it bigger and more exciting? What are you noticing? Whoa. It's bigger? Yeah, absolutely. Pretty sure our last container was about yay big. Woof. Does anybody notice anything else? I left my iPad over here. I'm going to come grab it. Ah, somebody noticed. Why is it steaming? Let's think about that, scientists. What does steam usually tell us about something? What does steam usually mean? What do you think? Ah, seeing a lot of people saying steam means that it's hot. Some people are saying that it's magic, possibly. But steam tells us that something is hot. It's giving off heat. I took off my gloves. I can feel the warmth from like way back here. This experiment gives off a lot of heat. When we use this powder to take those peroxide molecules and rip them in half, it releases a bunch of energy. That energy goes into boiling the water we just made in our chemical reaction that's still down in this container that we can only see the top of. It's boiling that water away into steam. And all of the oxygen is filling these bubbles that are now filling this little pool. Yeah. Oh, somebody asks, how does it smell? It smells kind of like soap. Yeah. We trapped that oxygen in, in soap bubbles, so it smells remarkably like soap. It's not too bad, actually. Alrighty, scientists. Now, I see we have a couple questions, and I almost let myself get distracted. If you have questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A tab, and we should have time for them at the end. Because our next experiment gets into some territory that people get pretty excited about. This is where we get into the fire experiments. Now, if we're going to be setting something on fire, we need to think about what kinds of things we need to create fire. So let's pretend that you're building a campfire. What are some things you need to build that fire to make it happen? Go ahead and check out this poll. What are some things that you might need? Select as many things as you can think of. Okay, I'm seeing an awesome mix of things. Fantastic. A lot of people saying wood. A lot of people saying newspaper. Here's what's funny is when I built this question, I actually knew you were going to need most of these things. I tried to trick you, but it didn't work. So in order to create fire, we need three basic ingredients. One of them we call a fuel. This is something like the wood or the newspaper. If you're camping, it might be dry leaves or Doritos. Something for the fire to eat. In a candle, it's the wax. Now we also need, I'm seeing a lot of people are saying oxygen. So wherever you're sitting right now, go ahead and do me a favor. Take a big deep breath. And let it out. Is there oxygen where you are? I hope so, or else we have bigger problems. This experiment that we tested earlier, this is actually an oxygen indicator. If I let in some of the air from outside, 
and shake it up. It'll change color around oxygen. So this is telling me that there is oxygen in this room, which, whew, thank goodness, or else I'd stop breathing and that'd be bad. So you need fuel, you need oxygen, and there's one more thing you need, something to get your fire started. So this is where people were talking about matches. I have a lighter because I have those instead of matches. Oh, no. You combine fuel, oxygen, and heat, you get, maybe, fire. Ta -da. That's a flame. Fire. Yay. Chemistry. Okay. I'm kidding. Wouldn't that be lame if I just like walked away and left you staring at a candle? Fire is a chemical reaction. Now, <laughs> yeah, I see people get excited about this one. Now, the reason that I wanted to talk about fire is because I wanted to introduce you to a kind of fuel that you may not have heard of before. It's awesome. It has a really fun name, too. It's called lycopodium. It actually comes from a plant, it comes from moss. Ha, it's about to get even better. Okay, now lycopodium is a powder. So it's got these little teeny tiny pieces. If you think about what it feels like, it feels kind of like um, flour or cornstarch, little teeny tiny particles. But check out what it does when you throw it at a fire. <laughs> Ready? Ooh. This is a fuel, right? Yeah. <clears throat> One more. No, I can do better. Okay, just wanting to do little ones today. Now, here's the question. I was doing this experiment a couple days ago and somebody said, dump the whole thing. And I had to um, politely decline because I like my fingers. Um, but we've been talking today about how to make experiments bigger and more exciting. So I wanted to at least consider what would happen if we changed this experiment. Since I don't want to take, I don't want to dump the whole cup of lycopodium powder while I'm holding it. That seems dangerous. I want to think about changing the experiment. So what if I reverse it and instead I light a little stick on fire and stick it in the powder? What do you think might happen? Based on what you've seen so far, go ahead and type in the chat. What is something that you might expect to happen? if I lit one of these little coffee stirrers on fire and stuck it in the cup. Go ahead and put your guesses in the chat. What do you think? I'm a little nervous. <laughs> okay, I'm seeing lots of fire. Oh, somebody says it might, tons of fire. Somebody says it might make it go out. Oh, interesting, okay might explode, might flare. Those are kind of our two options, right? Either the fire is gonna get bigger or not. So might make a loud noise, maybe while it's catching on a lot of fire. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to, I'm gonna grab a glove to protect my hand, you know? Okay. I'm gonna hold onto the stick. I'll light it on fire. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna just for safety. One, two, three. Okay, hang on. This might be a defective stick. A good scientist repeats her experiments. I brought more, don't worry. Let's try again. Okay, I'm gonna let it get nice and on fire. 
Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Well, y'all, what's going on? Why is it doing this? Somebody mentioned that they thought it might go out. Does anyone have any ideas? What are we missing? We need three ingredients to make fire, right? You need fuel, you need oxygen, you need heat. What's changed? What are we missing when we change the experiment like this? What are we missing? Oh, it needs oxygen. Yes, that makes sense. Because this powder, remember I said it's teeny tiny pieces? When it's sitting in the cup like this, all the pieces are super, like they're stuck close together. They're squished in, so there's not enough room for oxygen between them. So the fire can't burn. But when I take a pinch and I throw it, all the pieces spread out and it can burn. Okay, now, I mentioned here at OMSI, we're all about making things bigger and more exciting, right? And I do want to make it bigger and more exciting. Now, I brought this little, I brought this little, it's like a yoga ball pump, but it pushes air out, this little tube. I brought it for putting out candles, but I keep this powder in this little bottle, and this should fit in here. We're gonna try something. I'm gonna put this powder in the tube. Oh man. Now ready to see if this does something bigger, more exciting? One, two, three. <gasps> I think I need to do it again. A good scientist repeats her experiments, remember? One, two, three. Okay, that was okay. I think I can do better. Hang on. <laughs> Somebody's, I made a flamethrower. Kinda. This is where I, remem I remind you, do not try this at home. Trained professional. Ready? One, two, three. Ooh, that was a good one. Okay, I don't know if I can do better that one. I'm gonna quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> okay. So, now I'm actually gonna use this to put out the candle. Now, Let's come back to thinking our, our purpose for talking tonight is all about recognizing chemical reactions. So we've seen color changes, we've seen things that make bubbles. Now our elephant toothpaste was giving off heat. So is fire hot? Yeah. Fire is also bright and heat and light are both forms of energy. So when something is glowing or getting hot, that's a sign of a chemical reaction. So that's another thing we can look for when we're trying to think about if a chemical reaction is happening. Now, I see somebody mentioned the word bang, and I've been asking a lot tonight about how can we make this bigger or more exciting? That was pretty good. That was pretty exciting. Flamethrower was pretty awesome. But I think we can do better. You think we can make this bigger or more exciting? Does anyone have any ideas? How could we make that flamethrower more bigger or more exciting? Hmm. Any ideas for how we can make the, the flame bigger or more exciting? I got one. Okay. Oh, more oxygen, more powder. Yeah, so I'm gonna, more flamey stuff. Fantastic, I like the way you phrase that. More flamey stuff. So we're gonna do something kind of like the elephant toothpaste. We're gonna use a fuel that is stronger and more reactive 
than this powdered, like a podium. It's over here. I have a balloon. This balloon is full of hydrogen. Now, if you've ever seen the periodic table of the elements, imagine it behind me. The periodic table is this big sheet of squares. Hydrogen is in the upper left-hand corner. It's number one on the periodic table of the elements because it is the lightest, hence why the balloon is floating. I also happen to think it's because it's the coolest, but that's just me. Now, hydrogen is a very reactive element. It plays with all of the other elements a lot, and it plays rough. When we add hydrogen to a chemical reaction, it tends to get a little bit violent. It's very explosive. So we're going to make it explode. That hydrogen balloon is floating up there by itself, and I happen to have a candle on a stick. There's oxygen in this room, as we've previously discussed. So we have fuel, we have oxygen, and I'm going to add some heat. Now, scientists are safe, right? This lab coat is not quite enough to protect my body. So I'm going to change lab coats. Much better. This is a fire resistant coat. I'm a rather short scientist, so it covers most of my legs as well. So now I'm protecting my body pretty well. I also want to be protecting not just my eyes, but my whole face. So I'm going to trade out my goggles. For a face shield. Okay. Ah. Now. Oh, wait, my lighter is over here. Hang on. Alrighty, scientists, I realized I left one thing in my other lab coat. I'm protecting very many aspects of my body, but I also want to be protecting my ears. So I have earplugs. Because I don't know if you know this about explosions, but explosions can be loud. So I'm going to plug my ears. I'm going to light this candle. Okay. Now, wherever you're sitting, I want you to do a countdown with me, okay? At a respectful volume for wherever it is you are. But count this down with me, okay? Five, four, three, two, one. Yes! Ah, oh, fantastic. What do we think? Bigger and more exciting than the flamethrower? Ah, oh, so good. Now, explosions are pretty fantastic. That was pretty good. I feel pretty good about that. In this big, in this big sort of echoey room, that echoed really nicely. I don't know if you could hear it, but I'm all about making things bigger and more exciting, right? So what's bigger and more exciting than an explosion? How about five explosions? More stuff, right? I want to make sure these balloons are high enough above my head that I feel safe. I'm going to go up a little bit more. Is that all right, Scott? Too high? Okay, bring it down. That's okay. I'll scoot sideways, how about? Is that okay? That's good, okay. <laughs> this is why we have the protective gear. We're gonna do this 
one more time. Well, five more times. Earplugs back in. Scott's got his ears plugged. Face shield down. Alrighty, everybody. Wherever you're sitting, let's count it down together again. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, I missed one. Hmm. Ah, uh, and my candle's still lit. I have to come blow it out with my candle blowing mechanism. All righty, scientists. Ah, uh, oh, that was so good. Okay, now I can take my earplugs out. I also need to take, here's the thing about fire resistant coats. They're really hot. <laughs> So I'm going to go ahead and take this off. Whew. Okay. All righty, scientists. Oh, I'm seeing people saying that was awesome. That's amazing. I agree. Super cool, right? So as a quick recap, we have seen some amazing signs of chemical reactions. We have seen things that change color. We have seen things that bubble and fizz. We've also seen things that burn and explode. They give off heat and energy and light. All of those are signs of chemical reactions. Now, I don't know, I think that's amazing. Now, this is my favorite part. We have so much time. Does anyone have any questions? This is where we can head back into the question and answer session. So now I believe at this point, I get to turn it over back to Bianca. I'm not gonna wear my face shield for the duration of the q and I hope that's okay. <laughs> oh my gosh, everyone give Alex a round of applause, please. A virtual round of applause. There are, um, use your emojis, your best emoji in the chat to oh. kind of describe. I feel it, I hear it. Oh, people are saying it's fun. That's awesome. Okay. I'm going to dash off camera to grab my goggles because I feel naked no without them. While Alex is doing that, um, I wanted to ask you guys to go ahead and click on the Q&A in your um, upper right-hand corner. And you can add any questions that you have about tonight's show, about science, about Yay. chemistry, about OMSI, um, yeah. what it's like for Alex to work at OMSI and be a scientist, please pop those questions into the Q&A. You can also um, click the thumbs up next to the questions that you already see there. The questions that get um, the most upvotes will be answered first. So, um, I do some see some more questions coming in, so I am going to um, get those started. But let's see. Our first question comes from Kate, and um, she asks us pretty early on. What are some types of indicators? Oh, that's a great question, Kate. So. There are lots of kinds of indicators, and some of them have names that are very strange. Um, my very favorite indicator has a funny name that kind of sounds like somebody sneezing. It's called phenolphthalein. <laughs> um, it's an indicator that turns bright pink around a certain kind of chemical called a base. Uh, and so certain indicators different indicators tell you about different kinds of chemicals. So there's an indicator called universal indicator. It's actually four different indicators mixed together, but it basically makes the rainbow. It's that one that we used in the first experiment. Um, there's also an indicator, ooh, this is a perfect opportunity. There's an indicator you can make at home yourself using red cabbage. If you tear up some red cabbage leaves and boil it in water for a few minutes until the water turns purple, that can be its own indicator. It'll change different colors if you pour, say, something like lemon juice that's acidic. 
it'll change color. Or if you add baking soda, which is a base, it'll change a different color. That's a science experiment you can try at home. Thanks for asking, Kate. That is pretty cool. Um, so our next question comes from Raphael. And uh, that question is, what material is your suit made out of? I think uh, your coat, your uh, fire resistant coat. Oh, the fire resistant coat? Mm -hmm. That's, you know, it's a good question, Raphael. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. I'm going to see if there's a tag. I don't know if this is weird. Yeah, maybe we can, uh, <laughs> maybe we can uh, figure that out. If, uh, if yeah. Alex can't, we can figure out how to get you guys to answer later. Yeah, um, I can do some research and I can send it to you. I'm not totally okay. sure. Shiny silverness, so next, it reflects a lot of energy. I know. I think uh, it's a pretty fashionable item. I, I saw someone early on drop in the chat say they really liked it. So, uh, uh, well, <laughs> very fashion forward. <laughs> All right. Our next question comes from Melissa. And that question is, why is the foam orange? I think um, from the elephant <gasps> toothpaste. Experiment. The elephant toothpaste foam. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the bubbles have popped at this point or else I could show you. But the, the foam is orange because of the catalyst that we used. So that white powder that I dissolved in water to pour into the tall bottle, that, that catalyst is called potassium iodide. So that second word, iodide, tells us that one of the chemicals involved in it is iodine, which is like a brown liquid at room temperature. And so that brown liquid kind of gets, it's kind of a bystander in that chemical reaction. It doesn't really get used, it's just there. And so it kind of stains the bubbles an orangey brownish color. Okay. Yeah. All right, and uh, Anna asks, how could we absorb or reduce the oxygen from a big fire, such as the fire from Oregon or California? Yeah, the wildfires. That's a really wonderful question, Anna. So the challenging thing with big fires like wildfires is that they're in such huge areas. So if you think about, like in the chemistry lab, we have fire extinguishers, like the red tanks. And what they do is you spray them over the base of the fire and it pushes the oxygen in the air away and replaces it with a different kind of gas, usually something like carbon dioxide. And so without that oxygen, the fire goes out, kind of like it did with our lycopodium when we stuck the stick in the powder. So if, if we're able to push that oxygen out of the way, we can put those fires out. But when those fires are so big and like out in an entire forest, that can be really hard to do. It can be really hard to put out those fires just because they take up such a big area. It's one of the things that you can still hope that scientists can work on. <laughs> really big fire extinguishers, I think, is the answer. Yeah, we had some really, um, really drastic fires over the past year. Or so, and um, oh yeah, you know, it, it gets out of control pretty quickly. So, thanks Absolutely. to all the firefighters that were out there risking their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Just a reminder, guys, uh, your questions, you'll have to click on Q&A and it will, um, that will be highlighted and then put your questions there. Uh, questions in the chat uh, probably will get missed because people keep on commenting. So add them to the Q&A tab. Mm. Yeah. Our next question comes from Lena Fox and um, Lena asked, what chemical reaction do we see in our da daily life? I'm so glad you asked this. There are lots of chemical reactions we can see in our daily life, especially depending on what kinds of hobbies you enjoy. So there are chemical reactions that happen inside our body all the time. Our, our lungs and our body are turning oxygen into like, like using that oxygen for different organs to function. We're transforming some of our food into energy so that our hearts can beat and our brains can work and our limbs can move. But even outside of our body, a chemical reaction, lots of chemical reactions happen in the kitchen. So like I think I, it was on my introduction slide, I really enjoy baking. 
baking is all about chemistry. If you haven't had a chance to see it yet, there's a great TED talk or a great TED video about uh, the chemistry of making chocolate chip cookies. There are like five or six different uh, chemical reactions that go into baking chocolate chip cookies. The sugar caramelizing, the butter melting, the baking soda reacting and creating little air pockets that poof your cookies up and make them all chewy and delicious. Lots of chemical reactions in baking or cooking. Okay. And yeah. uh, our next question comes from Joseph. Why do you use those types of bottles? I think I saw this question pop up in the chat when we were doing the elephant toothpaste experiment. So I think, Joseph, you might mean the bottles that are shaped like this on the bottom and then with a big long neck on top. And the reason we use those types of bottles for elephant toothpaste experiments is because it helps the bubbles push up higher in the air. <laughs> it makes it more exciting. That's one of the other things we can change about how we do an experiment to make it bigger or more interesting. That bottle shape lets all of those chemicals mix in the big base and they start expanding. But when they hit that narrow neck, they expand up a lot faster. And so it makes them go whoosh up in the air. You might have also noticed that the hydrogen peroxide that I was using is usually stored in brown bottles. And so those bottles are brown to block out light from outside the bottle because that light can start breaking down that hydrogen peroxide and it kind of dilutes it in case that was the question. Can answer both. Um, yeah, we see a lot of different um a lot of different things sold in the uh, grocery store that come in kind of yeah. like brown bottles, right? And mm -hmm. I think it contributes not only to like the degrading of whatever material is in there. Yeah. Um, so our next question comes from Salvador. What if chemicals did not exist until 2021? Oh boy. Huh. That is an interesting question. Depending on, <laughs> oh, I'm struggling to think about how to answer that. So everything we can see and touch is made of chemicals. So like even like all the chemicals we use in our experiments are chemicals, obviously, but so is like the water you drink and the bread and the sandwiches you eat. All of that stuff is chemicals too. So if none of that existed, I don't know that we'd be here. I'm not sure our universe would exist. That's a very big and philosophical question. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I was like, that's a, when I saw the question, I said, that's a big question it. there. Um, yeah, but chem chemicals are all I around us. You know? <laughs> they exist naturally. Because um, there are man-made chemicals and then there are the naturally occurring ones, right? Yeah. Alex? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. That's a great question, though, Salvador. Um, our yeah, next question comes, Yeah. Next question comes around Kate Elizabeth. What would... Um, Remind us what was in the powder you used to make the fire bigger. Mm. Let me. It's called lycopodium. Let me see if I can type it in here so you can see how it's spelled. Lycopodium. Lycopodium. It's actually, I mentioned briefly that it comes from a plant. It's actually the spore of a moss. So some plants make new plants using seeds. Moss uses spores. And so the dried out spore of a certain kind of moss called club moss makes these little teeny tiny particles that turn out to be very flammable in the right conditions. It's used in a lot of um, like movies and TV shows as uh, special effects. Because it's Absolutely. nice and easy to control. Mm -hmm. um, Melanie's question is, what chemicals did you use in the beginning to make the words lights, camera, reaction appear? That's a great question. This is an easy one to replicate. I'm gonna, Scott's awesome, so he's going to be following me. So, oh, this is perfect, because one of our very first questions was about indicators, right? 
So I paint it. This is like filter paper, kind of like coffee filters, but paper sized. I painted with a clear indicator the words. That indicator is that phenolphthalein that I mentioned that changes color around a certain kind of chemical. This is a base. So this is ammonia. It's like a cleaning liquid. And so when we spray the cleaning liquid on that indicator, that indicator turns bright pink. And then as soon as that, that cleaning liquid, it evaporates really quickly. So it kind of dissolves away into the air. And when it does, the indicator goes back to being clear again. And so the message becomes invisible. Yeah. That's awesome. And it's awesome so cool. that you can go back and reveal it again. You know? I know, yeah. right? I actually, yeah. um, if you've seen OMSI shows like this with my co-presenter, Elizabeth, she made, she actually made these, um, I think before I even started at OMSI, we've been recycling them for at least three years. <laughs> wow. That's a long time. That's a long time. Yeah. Last. yeah. Very supply conscious. Okay. We have, um, we have some time for like the last couple questions. So, uh, yeah. Raphael asks, what did the foam-like material formed by the explosion smell like? Oh, the, the foam in the elephant toothpaste experiment? Um, I get that question a lot. It smells like whatever soap you use to make the experiment. So this soap is supposed to smell like coconut, but I don't smell coconut. I just kind of smell soap. Um, yeah. It smells like soap. Yeah. Clean. For, um, kind of following up with Raphael's question, when you did the smaller one with the yeast, were you able to smell that? That's a great question. So that one smells a little bit different because I didn't add soap to that one. Um, the yeast reaction just kind of bubbles enough on its own. So that one smells kind of... Um, I don't know, I'm struggling to find a way to describe what yeast smells like, but if you've ever baked with it before, you can sniff it. It has kind of a, like an earthy, bready kind of smell, and it just smells kind of like yeast. I think it's kind of nice. <laughs> yeah. I, I know a lot of people were uh, breaking, uh, making bread early last year, so maybe, uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe, I was maybe one of they them. do know what it smells like. Exactly. Um, our, our question from Melissa is, what are some man-made chemicals? Oh, boy. So, oh, man, there are so many. So if we think, let's, let's think just about elements, because chemicals is like everything. Um, let's think of, so the, all of the like big heavy elements, like the big ones at the bottom of the periodic table, ones with fun names like Neptunium and Uranium, a lot of those tend to be man-made. They can occur naturally, but mm, a lot of what we have is man-made. Also a lot of, really lots of chemicals just in general, like things that we use, um, oh gosh. Like here at OMSI, every so often we make our own soap. We have a class where we teach you how to make soap and we make the chemicals to make the soap. So that uses things like lye, which is used in drain cleaners and oils. Yeah. Does that help? Um, <laughs> I hope it question. helps. Uh, if, if it doesn't, you know, drop. Does that help? Um, I forgot who answered asked the question, but put a thumbs up in the chat. Um, our okay. next question comes from Kate, and uh, that is, what is the biggest explosion you have ever done? <laughs> the biggest explosion I have ever done. So we did five hydrogen balloons. I think for hydrogen balloons, the most I've ever done is six. But there is another explosion that we do in a different sort of OMSI program using liquid nitrogen. That's probably the biggest explosion I've done. That one involves basically kind of blowing up like a garbage can full of ping pong balls. I think that's the largest. That one also you can't stand anywhere nearby. Like you start it and you run. <laughs> Do not try at home. My goodness. I'm pretty, is it, is it loud? 
Is it oh, yeah. loud too? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. Very. Wow. <laughs> well, um, it looks like all of our audience questions uh, have uh, have been answered, but I have one more question for you, Alex. Yeah, um, what inspired you to do science and how did you become a scientist at OMSI? Oh, that's a great question. Oh, yay. Thank you for asking. So what inspired me to do science? I, to be totally honest with you, I, when I was a younger scientist, I really enjoyed mixing together. <laughs> My mom didn't love it. I would mix together things in the bathroom, like shampoos and conditioners. I would mix them together to see if I could make anything. And a lot of the time, nothing happened, but I kept trying because I wanted to see if it would work. And so then when I got older, I wanted to take more science classes with experiments that were maybe more likely to do things. <laughs> I also really enjoy astronomy. So I love going stargazing and thinking about how stars work. And so that's what one of the things I studied in school was how stars work. And one of the teachers that I had in college really inspired me to keep thinking about just whatever I find interesting. And so I love, that's one of the reasons I love answering questions so much is because I just, I love hearing through your questions like, what's going on in your brains and what you're curious about because it makes my brain ask questions too like like what is my fire resistant coat made of i don't know but i'm gonna go find out now because now i'm curious so i just like to learn new things i like to discover new stuff and i wound up being um an educator here at omsi because when i was in college i did a summer internship here where i helped build some activities for one of the exhibits over in the featured hall and it was so much fun uh and i decided that i just needed to have a job like this where i talk with people about science all the time because i could do this just for days i won't because scott has to go home but <laughs> <laughs> But I could. I just, I love talking about science. And so I worked at a museum in Spokane, but I live here. And I always wanted to come back because OMSI is a really special place. And so I'm so glad that I get to be here doing this with all of you. It's, it's the best job in the world. Well, we're so excited to uh, have been able to watch you do this tonight, Alex. We really thank you for being here. And, um, you know, I'm pretty sure that everyone enjoyed the show. Like it was spectacular. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Yeah, no problem. So that's the end of our Q and A. I think uh, Tamara is going to come back on screen now and we'll do some wrap up. Uh, Tamara, I'm having some trouble hearing you. Now, can you hear me, Bianca? I can hear you, Kelly. Um, Kelly, do you want to come in? Hello, everybody. Good evening. Well, wow, that was a truly magnificent show. And I hope that you are all as inspired as I am. Thank you so much from our team from OMSI. And uh, yeah, the, and Alex for this wonderful show. Before we end, I just wanna make a couple of announcements about some opportunities with Mesa. So uh, the first is Invention Bootcamp. We are, oh, real quick, I'll let Bianca catch up for our students. Uh, Fue un espectáculo magnífico. Espero que todos estén tan inspirados como yo. Gracias a Alex y al equipo de OMSI por este maravilloso espectáculo. Antes de terminar, quiero hacer algunos anuncios sobre algunas oportunidades próximas con Mesa. We are recruiting students for the 2021 Invention Bootcamp. Invention Bootcamp is a four week invention education experience for high school students led by PSU faculty, Dr. Jerry Rechtenwald and undergraduate engineering students. 
Usually hosted on campus at PSU, this year's camp will be online, um, but students must be currently enrolled in 9th through 12th grade and an Oregon resident to be eligible to participate. We encourage students of all backgrounds and experiences to apply. The deadline is Sunday, March 21st. Estamos, re, relu, estamos reclutando estudiantes para Invention Bootcamp. Invention Bootcamp es una experiencia de educación de inventos de cuatro semanas. Bianca, it looks like we can't hear you. Can you hear me? One moment, folks. Thanks for waiting. It looks like we're having some issues with our microphones. Can you hear me, everybody? Yes, okay, you can hear me? Okay, thanks so much, okay. All right, um, Bianca just shared the chat, the, the pop-up for Invention Bootcamp if you're interested in Invention Bootcamp. We also have, um, Mesa students will also have special access to join the Northwest Youth Careers Expo hosted by Portland Workforce Alliance. The Career Expo features over 80 companies and organizations for you to talk to. All Mesa students who've submitted an application and are 13 years or older should receive an email to join. Um, the Expo will feature a virtual exhibit hall where students and educators can visit booths to learn about different organizations um, and exhibitors can share materials and videos about their workplace. You, they can also uh, host chats to answer questions. In the virtual auditorium, students can hear career talks and engage with professionals. Students can also participate in a scavenger hunt for a chance to win prizes. And there's the pop up there. I, I've, I've heard some people can hear and some people can't. So um, we'll also make sure to keep those pop ups coming so you know what's coming up. Um, in addition to our Northwest Careers Expo, uh, we are excited to partner with OSU to host a college visit on March 30th from 3.30 to 5 p.m. Hear from current students, ask questions about college life at OSU and toward the College of Engineering. We've also partnered with local companies to bring you career visits. Representatives from each organization will be available to interact with students, give a virtual tour, and answer questions. We've already hosted two visits with Malum Architecture and Simplexity Product Development. Our next visit will be with Digimark on April 1st. Watch recordings of past visits and join us live for future visits by visiting our Big Marker page. And last but definitely not least, we will be hosting our Mesa Family Nights every Wednesday in April. Uh, you'll receive an email invitation as well as a phone call from a Mesa Family Liaison to learn more about those events. But you can see here we have April 7th for middle school students. It, um, that event will be held in English. And then we also have the following week a session in Spanish for our middle schoolers. And then our high school students the following weeks, um, the first week being English and the second being Spanish. Uh, I just want to thank everyone again for joining us this evening. We're sorry for the technical glitches at the end.
but we hope that you were inspired as I was today. It was so fun seeing you all react and have a good time. Uh, you can find more information and links for the recordings and our upcoming events on Mesa Everyday, our student website. And please do complete our event survey to let us know how it went and how we can improve. Further questions can be sent to us at ormesa at pdx.edu. We hope to see you all again soon and have a great night. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.